Good afternoon, everyone. If I could just get your attention, we're going to get started this afternoon. Um, I'll be brief. I think most of you know me. I'm Naraya Brodus from the President's Office. It's wonderful to have all of you here this afternoon. Um, this session is on faculty recruitment and retention. It's my pleasure to have Michael Mastanduno, Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and Joe Helbley, Dean of the Thayer School of Engineering, with us today to talk about practices in their areas, share a little bit of information with all of us. I think, as most of you know, the way our series works is that Joe and Mike will spend a little bit of time sharing information with all of us, and then we'll open it up for discussion and questions. We run until about 1 o'clock, and with that, I'll turn it over to Mike and Joe. Thank you, Naraya. Oh, we have chairs. We can sit down. Would you like to take a seat, Joe? Thank you, Mike. Right. Yeah. I'm not going to yeah. sit down. Uh, thanks all for coming. And I think faculty recruitment and retention is, from my perspective as the of the Arts and Sciences faculty, about the most important thing we do. Because right? when you really think about it, a lot of elements go into making an institution great. Really, the overall quality of the institution is based in many ways on the overall quality of the students and the faculty. I leave the student part to Maria and her great staff, and Joe and I are involved on the faculty side. So I just want to make a few brief comments because I think this is best for as a discussion session. But let me just say three things very quickly. First is I want to talk a little bit about the type of faculty member we look to recruit at Dartmouth. And I think it's important to talk about that because it says something about the identity of Dartmouth as an academic institution. Right? Think about a continuum of institutions from big research universities to small liberal arts colleges. We are squarely at the intersection of those two. When big research universities do recruitment, they are primarily interested in faculty scholarship. If faculty members care about teaching and are good teachers, well, that's a bonus. But that's not what they're looking for. Okay, conversely, when liberal arts colleges, high quality liberal arts colleges, you know, think of Colgate or Hamilton or Trinity or Williams, that kind of school, they are looking for faculty members. They are essentially looking for committed teachers. They would love it if these faculty members are also active scholars but the primary emphasis is on people who are going to work closely with undergraduates. Okay? Dartmouth sits at the intersection, and it's actually a very ambitious intersection, because what we are looking for are faculty members who are simultaneously research leaders in their fields and have a commitment to working closely with students, both undergraduates and, in some cases, graduates. Okay. That has implications for recruitment. We are competing with the big research universities, but we are looking for that subset of faculty members who are simultaneously committed to both sides of the job. And our processes all the way through are really geared to finding those types of faculty members and creating an environment where they can flourish. All right, so that's the first point, the kind of faculty member we're looking for and its implications for recruitment. Secondly, let me just give you a sense, a little sense of the size and scale of what we're talking about here. We have in arts and sciences about 420 tenure and tenure track faculty members. We have additionally about 200 visiting and adjunct faculty members. Of those 420, about 39% currently are female. About 20% self-identify as minorities, right, or underrepresented faculty. Each year, we hire or we search for somewhere between 30 and 35 faculty members. And we usually end up landing somewhere between 20 to 25. Okay, so there's turnover every year. The faculty as a whole, though, takes some time to turn over completely. Right, so that kind of gives you a sense of the scale of the faculty. 75% of the arts and sciences faculty are in the tenured ranks, and about 25% are 
in the assistant professor or, or untenured, more technically untenured. All right, last thing I want to talk about briefly as an opener is about the challenge of faculty recruitment <coughs> and retention. Because faculty recruitment and retention has become increasingly more difficult <coughs> over time. I don't want to date myself too much, but when I came here about 30 years ago, I went into the dean's office and Marissa Navarro basically said, this is the job, this is the salary, any questions, no good, you want it or not. And my response, because I study international politics and I'm a pretty tough negotiator, was, thank you. And there's even a salary that comes with a salary. They're going to pay me to do this. OK, it's not like that anymore. The same kinds of things all of you are seeing in the national and international economy, we are seeing in the academy. People are a lot more entrepreneurial. People are a lot more mobile. Even assistant professors, not just the peacock full professors you try and hire from other institutions. Even assistant professors come in with long lists of things they need in order to be successful. Right? So it's much more of a high-powered bargaining environment, and we're in tough competition with a lot of other schools, many of whom have advantages we don't have, and some of which we have advantages over them. So I just want to tick off what I see as four or five of those areas where we may have advantages or disadvantages in faculty recruitment and retention. Okay. One is location. Actually, a lot of people think, well, location must be hard for you to recruit faculty here. Not really, not at all. Location, in fact, I found in all the years I've been doing recruitment is kind of a wash. There are some people who simply are not going to come to Hanover, New Hampshire. They want to be somewhere else. They want to be in an urban environment. But we find there are lots of very high quality faculty members that actually want to come to places like Hanover, New Hampshire. We're starting a young family. We have two kids. We want to be in a place where you don't have to lock doors, where there's great outdoor activities, and a terrific school system, public school system, right? So some of those you win, some of those you lose. In direct recruiting, I find location to be more or less a wall. Far more challenging for our recruiting efforts are partner policies. Partner policies are in some ways the biggest challenge we face these days. Now again, I'll give you my own experience. When I came here 30 years ago, the last thing I thought of was that the institution had some obligation to find my partner a job. Okay, but it's not like that today. Right? The expectations have changed. And so when we're recruiting faculty members, as soon as we're sure we're hiring someone, the question of partner comes up. And that's where Dartmouth is at a disadvantage. And that's where location does matter, because in terms of partner policies, especially if partners are in the academy, it is much more difficult when you have one school that you have to place someone in, as opposed to think of the boss scenario, 10 or 15 or 20. Okay, that is a really big challenge for us. If you're in healthcare and want to do something at the hospital, we can probably help. Some high tech, thanks to Joe, we can do a little bit better. But broadly, it's much harder and much more challenging. And so we're constantly fighting those battles on part of the Third factor, housing. Housing should be an advantage. It should be because people think it is. They think, well, I'm not going to an urban area. I'm going to Hanover. I'm going to be a gentleman farmer with 50 acres. Well, you can, but not in Hanover <laughs> or Norwich. And so what we inevitably find is this expectation deflation problem where people come here and say, I can't believe the sticker shock of what it costs to live in Hanover. And I want to live in Hanover. I'm coming to Dartmouth because I want to work with students and be in that environment. And it's very hard to do. We have to do something about the housing problem. Okay, and it's, it's essentially a supply and demand problem. Fourth, I would call the, well, for lack of a better term, the playmate problem. Faculty members want to be around other faculty members who do what they do. Okay, so sometimes you call this a critical mass problem. Some of our best departments and programs at Dartmouth are large enough that when faculty members look at us, they say, I could see four, five, six, seven people I could work with. <laughs> Very hard to recruit faculty members when you tell them, you'll be the only one in your area, or there'll only be one or two of you. OK, 
Okay, now here let me make a plug for two important things. One is the relationship between arts and sciences in the professional school. Because a lot of times we can create critical mass, especially in the physical sciences, by connecting faculty members in the undergraduate college to Tuck, Thayer, and Geisel. Right? Think about biology as a natural area for this with the med school or computer science with engineers. Secondly, the president's cluster initiative, right, cluster hiring initiative, I think is really important here because that initiative is explicitly targeted to create those kinds of community of scholars who have right, like-minded interests. So what we're doing is attacking that problem always indirectly, but also now directly by saying we're going to pick some areas and actually hire people in ways where we could create that kind of critical mass. And that's crucial because the schools we're competing with, for the most part, for faculty members, are larger. Okay. I can't remember the last time I lost a faculty <coughs> member to Swarthmore or Hamilton or Williams. But Penn, Michigan, Berkeley, Princeton, those are the places we're competing with for the kind of faculty. So critical mass and having faculty members around you who do similar things, right, that matters. Okay, and the final challenge I want to talk about is the challenge of recruiting and retaining underrepresented minority faculty members. And I can say this in all honesty here. I've been here a long time. Dartmouth College is fully committed to this, from the president, through the deans, through departments. The problem that we face, primarily here, is that so is everyone else. I don't know a single peer institution that says, underrepresented minorities, we're fine. Don't worry about it, we got that covered. Everyone is pursuing a relatively small pool of underrepresented minority faculty members. Now, we're in a particular supply demand position now. Maybe 10 years from now, when more people are coming through the pipeline, pipeline, by the way, that we help right, to fill here through Mellon Mays and all sorts of other postdoc opportunities, the supply-demand balance may be a little better. Right now, it's really tough. We have a lot of schools pursuing a relatively small amount of great faculty members. And so every school, including Dartmouth, has to work extra hard in figuring out what you have to do to make sure you're winning in that game. Okay, and there we do okay, but I think we could do better. Let me just, since I know this will be a topic for conversation, let me talk about some of the things we do now and then we'll leave open uh, and I'll be looking forward to suggestions people have about this. Okay, first, we do 30 or 35 searches a year. Every single one of those searches, the antenna are up in whatever department or program is hiring to look for underrepresented minority faculty members in the pool. So pool creation is really crucial. And we work with Evelyn Ellis's office, IDE, on this. Okay, once a pool is created, Right? Departments will go through their processes and they're going to come up with their short list of candidates. These are the one, two, three people we want to bring to campus. If there are no underrepresented minorities in that group, the first question that Evelyn would ask, that I would ask, and that many times departments on their own ask is, are there underrepresented minorities and where are they in the pool? Fourth, sixth, eighth, fifteenth, fiftieth, where are they? We tend to bring out three people for job interview, the dean's office will always say, bring out a fourth one if in your top 10 or 15, if not in your top three, you have someone that can help us diversify the faculty. Okay. Down the road, the next step, if a department came to me and said, we have two great candidates, even though we only have one slot, and one of them is an underrepresented minority, in my office we will do everything we can to find the resources to hire two people. Okay, and even going a step further than that, even if there is no search in an area, if faculty members are able to bring forward to the deans what we call, quote unquote, targets of opportunity, faculty members, right, we will look to find resources to hire those people, even though we weren't looking in that area or we weren't looking for that particular field. Okay, the president's office recently has put together a pool of funds to help us do that, some additional resources 
so that if the problem on my end is we'd love to do it, but we don't have the resources, the president's office is now helping with the resources. Okay? Now, once underrepresented minorities are hired at Dartmouth, then the game is not over because retention is crucial. And it's crucial at both the assistant professor level and the post-tenure level. And I'll just say this very briefly in closing. At the assistant professor level, in my experience, the biggest challenge is to help faculty members find boundaries around all the different activities they're expected to do. And underrepresented minority faculty members have this particular issue, which is there are student groups that find them to be crucial as mentors, right? So they face an extra challenge. All Dartmouth faculty members mentor students in one way or another, but there are, there's an expectation for underrepresented minority faculty members that they have to do a certain kind of mentoring. And our job as deans is to make sure, and as faculty members, that they're able to do that, but at the same time are able to do the kind of research and teaching that we know, and the reason we hired them is we know they can get through the tenure barrier to do that, and in a way that's gonna make them both viable and competitive candidates for tenure. So it's sort of drawing those boxes and those lines that's a key part of the kind of mentoring. All right, I'm going to stop there. I don't want to go too much further. I'm going to ask Joe to say a few things, and then we'll open this up and, and have a discussion. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm not going to add very much to what Mike said, because I think our general approach is very similar in terms of faculty hiring and also steps that we take, pool building, identification of candidates, making the actual offer, and then working through to the process of tenure to focus on retention. Let me just say a couple of things that are a little bit more specific to engineering because I think they're relevant in the <coughs> physical sciences as well. Um, our expectations at Thayer, as Mike said at the outset, are for true teacher scholars. To put it in context and to put a number on it, because that's what we engineers like to do is put numbers on things, there was uh, the American Society for Engineering Education publishes number of degree recipients scaled to the number of faculty. So bachelor's degrees in field per faculty member. A measure of how large your undergraduate program is in the context of the overall school of engineering. We find that we're on the top 20 list, okay, in terms of most bachelor's degrees granted in engineering per member of the tenure track faculty. That's great, very productive, engaged faculty. Very few of our research intensive peer institutions are on that list. On the research side, our faculty are routinely in the top 20 to 25 percent, or top 20 to 25, absolute, nationally in terms of funding raised per faculty member. So they're also on the list of the most research intensive institutions. Very few of our peer institutions that value teaching significantly are on that list. And so the, when we are searching for faculty, we are really looking for people who are unusual in their commitment to teaching and their commitment to original, externally funded scholarship that supports PhD students, master's students, as well as undergraduates. Mike very nicely articulated the advantages and disadvantages that our rural location and the size of our faculty poses. Let me just add one challenge in the area of the sciences that didn't come out in his discussion. Faculty sometimes will be looking, we will be competing with institutions that will have departments of mechanical engineering or electrical engineering that are in larger than the entire Thayer School of Engineering faculty. People may have the right mindset, be dedicated teachers and scholars will be a perfect fit, but that institution, that large department of mechanical engineering will already have physical infrastructure because there will be 10 colleagues already working in a related research area that we don't have and would have to provide. Right? And so being competitive in terms of putting together research facilities and startup funding is a challenge. But on the opportunity side, I would say one of the things that I think we at Thayer have used to our advantage, and I see Dartmouth and certainly Phil Hanlon has spoken to this directly, moving in this direction as well, is focusing on the experiential learning opportunities here at Dartmouth. And these extend across the curriculum, across the institution. This is something that at Thayer really distinguishes our undergraduate program and there are faculty members who are tremendously excited by that opportunity. We use that to our advantage. The emphasis on innovation and entrepreneurship is something that we very much use 
to our advantage in the faculty recruitment process. And finally, for us, the fact that we do not have departmental boundaries within the Thayer School of Engineering. There is no electrical engineering department. There is no chemical engineering department. So not just our highest level scholarship, but our teaching cuts across departmental boundaries that you would find in a traditional school of engineering, involves collaboration with many of you across this campus, outside of engineering, which is highly unusual, and is focused on broad problems in areas like energy or the interface between engineering and medicine that faculty candidates and our students care deeply about. And so we're able to use our structure to our advantage. We face the challenges in cost of living. When Mike was speaking, a few of you may have seen me looking at my iPhone. That's because walking over here, I got an email from someone I'm, let's say I'm in conversation with, who pointed out to me in an email this morning that the cost of living in Hanover is 32% higher than the national average. And he gave me a link to support his, his point. I haven't had a chance to look at the link yet, but I suspect his comment is typically, is probably spot on. This is very different than the negotiation you would have undertaken 30 years ago when you were considering a faculty position. We have programs and processes in place to try and address this, but we're in a very competitive environment. So let me simply stop there, and I think we have about a half an hour. We can open it up broadly for discussions, suggestions, <coughs> questions, and comments. Thank you, Joe. OK. Antonio Dillis, do you need a, do you need a, I don't need a mic. Oh, they want, they want a mic uh, only because they're trying to tape this, Antonio. So. Yeah, this is for history, so keep that in mind. Yes, I, I don't know if Naraya said this at the outset, but the session yeah. is being recorded and will be available for viewing for afterwards. Purposes, That's right. Political scientists, right? Okay. Mike, the, first of all, thanks so much for laying out all of the intricacies relative to, uh, relative to re, uh, recruiting and retention of faculty. Um, I have a particular question, comment, slash concern. Um, I happen to know that in one search that's active this year, that there were three highly qualified uh, minority applicants, first, second, and third choice. Um, and in my conversations with the, um, with the chair of the search committee, as well as my conversations with the chair of the department, we came up with strategies to try to implement this potentiality of a twofer because of this, this cluster reach of, of, of these three scholars in particular. Um, and it was brought back to me from the chair of the search committee as well as the chair of the department that the divisional dean said no, and it stopped there. So the, church, the, the search is still inconclusive. There are two other candidates who are positioned to come to Dartmouth. One is ready to sign if we were to offer. And so we run the risk of not losing one, but potentially three out of this search because of these stop gaps. And it's, it's of concern to me when I know I've heard you and I believe you on multiple levels because of my interaction with you, that in the dean's office at your level, yes, there is the communication relative to um, two firsts, relative to target of opportunity hires, but when some of us as chairs, when we get to the associate dean level, it stops there. And so what are we to do, particularly in light of the search that's going on now? Well, first I want to say I don't really want to talk about a particular search, um, but the general problem you're raising, I think, is a really great one. And I want to first point out the great silver lining in what you said. We produce the search that has three qualified yeah. underrepresented minorities. We want to figure out what we did in that search to get to that point, because even if we blow this one, you're not going to blow every one. If you can create a situation where you're actually generating the kind of pools that produce those kinds of highly qualified candidates, we're on the right road. Okay, second thing I'd say is, again, I don't know the machinations of the particular, well, I know some of it, I don't want to talk about it, but there are different kinds of strategies that different departments are going to adopt in order to get their first choice versus their second choice. And you can imagine departments not being fully convinced that they will in fact get two and worry that if we go to someone who's not our first choice and get that person, the deans may turn around and say, well, you got one, so let's hold out for number one first. In this case, I don't know what's going on, but I think those kinds of strategies are playing out 
all the time. Our job is to make sure we get the result at the end. So in this particular case, what I would say, quite frankly, is I'm not going to worry about the two for just yet. I want to get one first, and then I want to go from there. But I think you're right, and you're raising what is a really interesting problem that faculty members in the room will understand, which is the kind of department interest and department autonomy don't always match up, right, with sometimes with larger institutional goals. Yeah. We have a meeting. I'm going to we'll continue this conversation. I'm sure I will see you on this again. Lynn back. Microphone coming. Hi, thanks for creating this forum. My name is Angela Parker and I'm an assistant professor in Native American studies. And um, I was wondering if uh, you could speak a bit more to uh, retention uh, initiatives that are aimed uh, towards you know, assistant professors um, on tenured faculty. Um, <clears throat> I noticed during your presentation there was significantly less information about Dartmouth initiatives in the retention area. Um, and I was, uh, thinking about uh, sort of some of the reasoning that you put out there in terms of uh, the expectations of community involvement um, that were placed towards especially minority faculty. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure that those expectations actually correspond to sort of uh, the informal experiential uh, sort of feedback that I've participated in about what uh, makes you know sort of the the assistant professor experience at Dartmouth um, challenging um, so I'm wondering also you know as you think about or respond to uh, what sort of initiatives are, are already in play has there been any attempt to study or to survey um, especially uh, faculty of color that leave Dartmouth okay great so there's a number of good questions in there one is about sort of mentoring of assistant professors, right, in this sort of think about the first six years of rank. And I would say at Dartmouth, mentoring's taken pretty seriously. And I say this sort of given my knowledge of the academy broadly. We're not the kind of place where you come in and we say, good luck, go do some work, we'll see you in six years and we'll give you an up or down decision. Right, so as you know, Angela, every year, every assistant professor meets with their associate dean, right? Has a one-on-one -on -one meeting to talk about what went right, what went wrong, what's going on in teaching, what's going on in research. Sometimes there are things you don't want to hear in those meetings, but those are mentoring meetings, right? And I think that's pretty important. The third year review at Dartmouth is really a midterm report and it's an attempt to think about where is this particular faculty member positioned for the upcoming sixth year, roughly, tenure review. Right? And in that third year, you get a full review of your teaching and your research and a letter, and in this case, unlike in the tenure process, a public letter that basically is shared with the candidate that says this is where your department or program kind of sees you and this is what they think needs to be accelerated or just kept going the way the way it is, right? So I think all along the way, you have those kinds of mentoring efforts. And to me, those are de facto retention efforts. Because essentially, what the institution is trying to do is say, look, we don't want to surprise at year six. These are the kinds of things you have to do to succeed here. And by the way, the things you have to do to succeed here are likely the things that you would have to do to succeed somewhere else. So if you choose anywhere along that line that you want to be somewhere else, you're well positioned. We don't want you to leave, but then again, we're not trying to create a faculty member where people don't have the options to leave. The kind of faculty member I want is a faculty member that could be anywhere but wants to be here. Not a faculty member that can only be here and so they grudgingly stay here. Right? So people leaving, people coming, I don't worry about that. I worry about keeping the quality of the faculty high, and creating the kind of mentoring efforts that put us in a good position to retain people when they, as they inevitably, be, inevitably do, reach the point where they're attractive elsewhere. Mike, if I can just add a, a comment. One of the things that we've started um, doing in engineering, and in part because of our desire to make sure assistant professors are well supported as they develop their portfolios towards tenure, 
is we've gone a step further in the engineering world and started formally assigning a mentor that is in the offer letter by name. And the reason we do that, my first few years here, we had an informal network. We would tell our faculty candidates that we had this. And then I realized that as part of the recruiting process, it would be much more meaningful to them if it was someone, they have significant input in this. It can be someone in their research field. It can be an outstanding teacher. It could even be someone outside of engineering. It could be someone that they just felt they forged a personal bond with during the course of the interview process. The whole idea is for them to have someone who is a sounding board that they can walk through these six years together and get unfiltered advice from. And one of the things we do is we tell them any conversations you have, you can consider privileged. Of course that person will weigh in as part of the broader faculty discussion at reappointment and tenure. But any questions you take to the person about how do I do this, should I pursue that grant proposal, should I be developing a course at this level, that's meant to be advice and guidance that's significantly outside of the tenure process. Just, just a way to try and provide additional support to help them be successful at the point of tenure. Yeah, Michelle? Hi, um, my name is Michelle Warren and I'm Professor of Comparative Literature and responsible for the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship, which mentors young scholars who care about diversification and underrepresentation in higher education to earn PhDs and hopefully become professors and maybe someday come back to Dartmouth, who knows. Um, I have a question for, about engineering. Um, I'm really excited about the expansion of Thayer because in my role with Mellon Mays, I keep tabs on demographics of PhDs reported each year through the NSF. Um, and I look across fields, even though engineering isn't one of our direct areas of responsibility. Um, and I'm curious how the demographics on uh, underrepresented candidates who are earning PhDs in various fields in engineering are being taken into account in the definition of the fields that will be uh, sought for in the expansion process because it, engineering, like many fields, has certain pockets where uh, there are more diverse pools of applicants than in other areas. Thanks, Michelle. And you know, as I said at, at the outset when I spoke for a few minutes, I think that's an advantage that we have, or I should, the lack of a departmental structure is an advantage we have because the demographics, if you've looked at engineering data, you know vary tremendously by field. Biomedical engineering is more diverse, particularly with regard to gender. Chemical engineering is pretty good. Civil engineering and mechanical less so. Electrical engineering and computer engineering are, although there is, there's less gender diversity, there's some racial and ethnic diversity in computer engineering, at least it doesn't appear in some of the other engineering fields. But it is a challenge across the board. Our approach in every hire that we have made is to look for people who can contribute broadly to these outward looking problem areas that we've identified, particularly energy or the interface between engineering and medicine, the role that engineering will play in healthcare for the next half century or century. By approaching things that way, we are opening the search up to a much more diverse pool of candidates than we would if we were looking for an electrical engineer who was working in the area of power electronics. And we found by doing this, this was a change in our approach to searches and hiring that we started about seven years ago. And so we, we went down this path with some trepidation. Will we find the people who need to teach the electrical engineering circuits classes, as an example? We absolutely have. And it's been great for us because it shows the pool of candidates you're connected across the institution and supported across the institution, not just in a narrow discipline. You know if you've looked at the, the numbers that the numbers are challenging. It's something like 20% of the engineering PhDs go to women, African American, Latino scholars. It's less than 2%. Um, but taking this approach, um, we've been able to build very diverse pools. And if you look at our faculty now compared to a decade ago, the junior faculty we've hired are a much more diverse cohort of very talented teachers and scholars. Um, start over here and then we'll come this way. Sure. Since you are aware that a lot of the faculty from underrepresented communities um, have other obligations or are seek, sought out as mentors. How could you possibly use that to be a part of um, the checklist of whatever you use to give tenure to those um, members? Because practice of what you study or, or building community 
should be something that you invest in as well. I think that's a, a great comment. I would say it's already part of the checklist. And the question of tenure is always the balance. Right? So it's not that it is ignored or undervalued. It is valued. When you look at the tenure process at Dartmouth, as in most academic institutions, teaching, research, and service, right, in some balance, all matter. Okay? Service tends to matter less than the other two. Or to put it differently, an exceptional, extraordinary service record cannot compensate for a weak research record or a weak teaching record. And that's the basic message that I have to give to all faculty members. There's not going to be a different standard for different faculty members. All faculty members have to understand there's a certain threshold of quality in teaching and research that one must achieve in order to succeed in the academy. Other things count. And at Dartmouth, they actually count more than they count in a lot of places. In fact, teaching at Dartmouth counts more than it does in a lot of places, where the tenure review is basically a scholarly output and reputation review. Okay? But I would be misleading people if I were to tell them that they could do more and more service and compensate for the kind of research and teaching record that is generally required to get tenure at Dartmouth. I just couldn't do that, it would be irresponsible. Hi, I'm Lisa Valdez, Chair of Latin American, Latino, and Caribbean Studies and Professor of Government. Um, I, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking that one of the log jams in hiring, in fact, is not at the administrative level, but in, within individual departments. And I wonder, and it's a genuine question I have. I didn't want to say it. What can we do better to educate the existing faculty about how to make hires of underrepresented groups, to reassure faculty that targets of opportunity are there, they're supported by the institution, they're good things to, to pursue, um, and to kind of provide <laughs> incentives, if you will, for existing faculty to take this issue seriously and make it a priority in hiring? Yeah, I, that is, that's a terrific question and insight in that question. And the associate deans and I have spent a lot of time recently thinking about this. Uh, and I, I think of it in, in this way. At Dartmouth, we know how to play the game, but I'm not sure we know how to win the game. And there's a big difference between the two. And playing the game requires all kinds of elaborate and necessary bureaucratic structures. Okay. The problem with that, and I'll give you a, a clear example of it, our Office of Institutional Diversity and Equity is about how you play the game, right? And Ellen is very good and very conscientious and goes department by department making sure that search committees are following the rules of the game. The problem is if you stop there, or worse yet, if you assume that following the rules means you've done your job, then you're going to come up short, as Lisa's describing. So what we've been thinking about is, and we use this term, how do you win this game? Not how do you play it, how do you win it? And one of the things we've realized we need is a faculty member, right? Someone with some credibility with departments that doesn't look like an administrator coming to tell you what to do, who essentially is tasked with understanding the nuances of how you create more diverse pools and how you actually attract more diverse candidates. Because there's a whole underlayer right, of activities that could go on and signals that can be sent that a lot of our departments aren't sending. And they're not sending them because they're malintentioned. They're, they're not sending them because they don't know what they are. So I think we need to commit some resources to having a person who is in some ways an interlocutor between the departments doing the searches and the administration that is, in some ways, funding and, and allocating the lines for searches. So I think that's actually a great question. A lot of the problem, I mean, the problems are at various levels, but there are problems at the department level. And sometimes those problems are simply, we don't know enough. We don't know where to look. If someone just told us a little bit more about where and how to do it, we would do it. 
Okay? And I, I think our job as deans is to make that job easier for faculty. And I think we can do more than we've done there. Yeah, come across to Amy. <laughs> Hi, my name is Amy Bong. I'm an assistant professor in the English department. And I just wanted to enter this conversation to nuance a few of the categories that you've helpfully outlined, Mike. Um, one, the first of which is about the boundaries um, that uh, often junior faculty members of color need to um, in instill in their daily practice in order to assure the balance that you're looking for. What that boundary drawing looks like though on the ground is quite it feels quite different and I think you need to know that um, it often feels like I will be there's no flexibility about certain departmental or um, college-wide requirements for my time that might involve you know a seven hour a day at some points and for a symposium that may or may not relate directly to my work or to the kinds of things I want to be thinking about. And then that is, in order to compensate in sort of the equation of balance of time, that's taking away from the time I want to spend mentoring the student communities that I believe in and want to support. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of the balance that I want to achieve, um, that the mentorship work that you're talking about is sustaining to me and my scholarship and my experience here and I hope it is also for the students that I'm reaching out for right and um, I it doesn't feel as though there's a way we can compensate for the kind of mentorship that I'm doing um, in a kind of algorithm that get, translates into tenure or necessarily in terms of taking time away from other obligations that I have to my department, which I also think are important. Um, so what are we left with then? Um, ultimately, I think we, that balance is quite a dream. Um, I'm not sure how implementable it actually is. Um, I also wonder about going, whether the, powers that be go to bat um, for faculty of color uh, when it comes time for um, partner hires or other kinds of accommodations to help retain faculty of color. Um, is that, are those efforts on par with, or do they even, do, are they on par with superstar retention? Um, because I think if it's really the language of, yes, we need to address this, everyone agrees, then there need to be some exceptional measures made to, to go to bat in those cases. Um, the next sort of point of nuancing is about critical mass. Um, I thought it was a great point, and yes, I think, but I think critical mass has to be a concept that goes beyond numbers, um, partially because what I've experienced um, is sort of serial critical massing, which is rather, um, <laughs> Uh, unproductive um, in the long run. There's a revolving door problem. And I feel like if there is a kind of critical mass that accrues over time, then you're really talking about retention. Otherwise, you're just sort of talking about endless massing to no end. Um, and finally, I just wanted to offer one potential uh, concrete suggestion, which might look like um, an internal Dartmouth fellowship to support the scholarly production of faculty of color. And that's where I wanted to end. Great, okay. Uh, let me just, I think I saw four or five arguments in there. Let me just take at least a couple of them. Um, let me leave aside the fellowship idea. I'm, you know, sort of a fellowships for faculty. I'm all for fellowships that target particular groups of faculty. I got to think harder about. Um, but let me work backwards on the other substantive points that you made. One was about achieving the balance, right? Your first point. I hope it's not a dream, right? And I think everybody faces it in one way or another. And remember, the six years of an assistant professorship are about the most challenging, not only in an academic career, but frankly, in any career. Okay, think about what tenure really means. A tenure decision at year six means that if you're doing a good job, you can get fired, okay? 
all these hotshot businesses that talk about how they cut people here and cut people there, I don't think they just fire people for doing a good job. In the academy, tenure is an extraordinary privilege. It's an institution saying we're willing to make a 30 year plus commitment to someone and to give them the freedom and flexibility to basically do what they want in their scholarly life and in their balance once they have it. So yes, it is a tough, it's gonna to be a tough thing. Exactly, exactly, as in the nature of the term privilege, that's right, it has been. And in fact, that is now changing. But you're right, if you looked historically, you and I would look at that same data and agree. But the point I want to make is, don't give up on finding that balance simply because it's challenging. I find that the junior faculty members who don't succeed are the ones who throw up their hands and say, I'm being asked to do something impossible, so instead of trying to do it, I'm gonna sort of adopt a different technique here, right? That's not the way to go. It can be done and you can pull it off. Right. There were two other, I'll get to you in a second, Angela. There are two other points you raised. The second one was about on recruitment and retention and do we work hard for partner policy for partners of underrepresented minorities? Unequivocally, yes. Do we succeed all the time? Unequivocally, no. But to think that we don't work on it would really be a misunderstanding of what we're doing at Dartmouth and what we're doing in the dean's office. And you had a third point and I just lost it. Critical mass, absolutely agree with you. I agree 100%. That is really what we're trying to achieve. I looked at the data over the last five years. We hired about 95 people in arts and sciences over the last five years. 27% of them self-identified as underrepresented minorities. That's pretty good given that we have 20% underrepresented minorities. Of the people who left, about 80 faculty members left. 20% of them were underrepresented minorities. So you're right, it's sort of coming in, going out, coming in, going out, and you're hoping more are coming in than going out. But you put your finger on really what the right problem is. I think at a certain point, there is a tipping point. We're not there. And once you get to that, you kind of have a much more robust foundation. And so you're not kind of reeling every time one or two or three people leave for totally idiosyncratic reasons. Uh, so I think you're absolutely right. You're right on that point. Yep, go back here. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Donna Hay, Associate Director of Admissions at the Tuck School of Business. Uh -huh. As you can see from, um, I think, our attendance here um, in larger numbers that I think typically exist in many meetings at Dartmouth, this is a critical issue for faculty and staff of color. That's right. Where there are students in attendance, there are alumni in attendance, um, because this is just of such importance to us. And I, I have a question, but I'd like to preface my question by getting clarification on one point, which is in, in the conversation, sometimes I find at Dartmouth that there's not really a distinction between minorities and underrepresented minorities, because not all minorities are underrepresented, all right? So I just want to be clear, in the conversation which we're having, is a distinction being made between minorities and underrepresented minorities? Uh, it depends on context. I mean, if we're talking about data, for example, like I'm giving you some data on self-identified minorities there, whether or not they're represented or underrepresented, it's self-identified categories. So African Americans, Native Americans, Asian Americans, Latina, <laughs> Latino Americans would be in that category, yes. Okay, and this is, um, this is a distinction I often find myself having to make with my colleagues. Um, yeah. Not for, and I often want to be clear in clarifying that it's not for purposes of, um, of, of, of difference or marginalization that I make this clarification, but just for factual clarification. Yeah. Asian Americans are not underrepresented in higher education. When it comes to percentages, in terms of the number of students graduating with college degrees, Asian Americans actually outpace white Americans in the United States of America. And so when we talk about underrepresented minorities, those populations include African Americans, Hispanic Americans, and Native Americans. And some Asian, and some Asian Americans, right, Pacific Island, exactly, particularly. So um, I just always like to clarify when we're having conversations around minorities, what populations we're talking about, because it gives me context. That's fair. Um, yeah. My larger question um, is in regards to, you referenced the, um, the Office of Institutional Diversity and Equity. Mm -hmm. And let me just say, when I make this comment, I speak individually, I speak for no one else. In the time that I've been here, I've had numerous conversations with others of color 
who feel that our Office of Institutional Diversity and Equity is not robust in its efforts. And what one will often find in an institution, I've worked in several, is that sometimes there are change agents and sometimes there are offices that exist because they fit very much the culture around them. And so there is a comfort level with checking the box and saying this is being done as long as it's being done at a comfort level with which we all really are able to live. And I'm curious as to what assessments are being done about the efforts of the office and its the individuals that compose that office to assess its efficacy. Because I will say once again, speaking individually, but based upon multiple conversations, amongst faculty and staff of color, there is a predominant feeling that that office is not assertive in its efforts. Yeah, uh, I'm not gonna comment at all on your perception on the question of assessment and evaluation. Uh, honestly, I don't know how that works because it's done out of the provost area. Uh, I can only assume that the provost area, as in all of the units that report to it, has means of assessment and evaluation, and I assume they apply equally to the particular area we're talking about. But honestly, I would be talking out of turn because I simply don't know, uh, you know wh what kinds of evaluations are done and under what circumstances. Almost getting the hook here. It looks like we might be able to get one more. Sylvia? Yeah. Nah, you know, I know you can, but. Hi, I'm Sylvia Spieth in the Spanish Department in Comparative Literature. And I'm wondering, um, I'm thinking about the CAP, constitution of the CAP. Yes. Because I remember a case years and years ago of a, call, a female colleague that came up for tenure and was told, was I, th I think turned down because her scholarship was not considered scholarly or um, scientific. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So another female colleague was on the CAP and fought the battle of her life and this person got tenure. So what I'm thinking from this is having seen the last couple of cases on the CAP that went down last year that was very painful to see, I'm wondering whether we shouldn't think of changing the composition of the CAP for uh, those cases that come up, to have somebody talk for underrepresented minorities at those meetings. Because I think what Amy was saying, what a lot of uh, uh, colleagues are voicing here is, I don't think that we, I, I think this kind of universal standard can play both ways. And I think it's played in a very bad way often. So I think it could be an easy way to sort of bring in outside experts to those CAP meetings and you know, speak for uh, the people coming up for tenure. I mean, I, I understand exactly the kind of problem you're addressing there. The solution requires a lot more thought and not a lot more thought just on my part or yours, but on the faculty's thought. And the reason I say that is simply this. If we are to create different kinds of committees and different kinds of standards, well, let me just say, I see a lot more problems <laughs> than I do opportunities there. Um, that's just me. The faculty, the CAP is elected by the faculty. The faculty can always decide what the composition and constitution of the CAP is. Uh, I just think what you're suggesting makes, at one level, makes a lot of sense. At another level, is a pretty challenging thing to pull off and the devil's in the details in a way that would be perceived by fair by all faculty members, not just the ones uh, that you're particularly concerned about in this case. So, hey, let's have that discussion. I'm open to it. Okay, I just want to say one more thing. Joe, you were actually on your phone while I was talking. Did you say that? I was checking data, Mike. Okay, you're checking data. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, please join me in thanking Joe and Mike for being with us this afternoon. Thank you. A <laughs> um, couple of housekeeping notes. So one, as Mike mentioned, or as Joe mentioned, this is being taped. So all of our sessions are taped. You can find them on the President's Office webpage under Moving Dartmouth Forward. The links are there for the YouTube videos. Just give us a day or so to actually have the final link posted. Um, 
Joe and Mike are also speaking this evening at 6.30 in Fahey on the same topic. So for all the students here especially, please let others know about the conversation this evening. Um, that session is not taped, but all are welcome. It's in Fahey Lounge on the ground floor. And we do have, I think, three more sessions scheduled for this term. Again, you can find those on our website. Um, just a note that next week's session is actually breaking from our usual schedule. It's on April 22nd, which is Tuesday, noon to 1, and then 5.30 to 6.30. That's on addressing sexual assault. So, thank you. Sorry. Pardon me. Um, <coughs>